sir. Good evening, good afternoon, or good morning, wherever you are in the world. Welcome to our online conference today. Before giving the floor to our dear guest, I want to introduce our team. I will be the moderator of today's conference. My name is Aytan Alpay. I am one of the, uh, the residents of the Neurosurgery Department of Izmir Atatürk Training and Research Hospital. These online education uh, meetings have started with Professor Kazan Kamil Sucu, the program manager of the Neurosurgery Department of Izmir Atatürk Training and Research Hospital, and goes on with the contributions of all the residents. All microphones will, uh, will keep turned off during the presentations of the lecture to avoid voice and noise pollution. You can ask your questions by writing to the uh, chat part of the Zoom program. At the end of the presentations, your questions will be asked to the lecture and will be discussed. Mutual discussion is not appropriate for the format of our meetings. Please do not ask for your microphone to be turned on. And now I would like to introduce our guest. It's my privilege to present our lecture. Sorry, uh, I must uh, turn off the microphone. Uh, and I will turn on your microphone. Okay, and now I would like to introduce our guest. It's my privilege to present our lecture, Dr. Gudolt de Gutter. He finished the Leiden University Medical Center and became a medical doctor in 2003. Dr. De Gutter completed his neurosurgical residency in Leiden University Medical Center between 2006 and 2012. He also earned United States medical license in 2008. He got his PhD degree in 2013. He has been president of Peripheral Nerve Section of the Dutch Society of Pork Neurosurgery. He has been treasurer, treasurer of the Dutch uh, Spinal Society, and he has been Comrade Member of the Peripheral Nerve Section for the, uh, for the World Federation of Neurological Surgeons, 2022. He has published six articles on Malagia Parasitica in the last 10 years. He has been the first author of all these six articles. His H and the index is 17 uh, in the web of science. Welcome, Ed, welcome again. Good afternoon, Dr. Now you can start sharing your screen. Okay, now I'm sharing my screen. Can you all see it, uh, the screen? Yes. Okay, good evening everyone and uh, thank you Iper for your kind introduction and thank you also uh, Hassan for arranging everything and of course Professor Aki Kots for uh, the invitation also to present uh, on my favorite subject, uh, Miralgia Parasthetica. In my personal opinion, nerve surgery is an important part of neurosurgery. Uh, but if you look at the results of this questionnaire, which was conducted by Ellen Manneker in the US, you can see that a lot of neurosurgeons in the US are not quite familiar with compression syndromes other than carpal tunnel and ulnar neuropathy. You can see also with the red square that 70% uh, of the neurosurgeons never perform surgery for, all, for neuralgia parasthetica and only 0.3% perform less than 20 procedures per year. So I hope today's presentation will encourage encourage others listening to this presentation to start operating for a myralgia parasthetically and hopefully in the future we'll make the treatment better for these patients. So these are the outlines for today's presentation. I'm going to discuss first the symptoms, a little bit of history on myralgia parasthetica, then the pathophysiologist, uh, diagnosis, anatomy and treatment. Uh, the word myralgia parasthetica comes from the Greek words myros and augos, which means pain in the anterolateral part of the thigh. It's caused by compression of the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve. And uh, for the next uh, part of the presentation, I will just abbreviate it to LFCN. Patients can have several symptoms, and often when they come to your clinic, they talk about a tingling or burning sensation in the anterolateral part of the thigh. And in my experience, when symptoms get worse, 
they often extend far below the knee. So that's something which is important to realize that that's possible. Often patients also have a strange feeling when they touch the skin. And sometimes when they're sitting in front of you, they're kind of touching the outside of their upper leg as kind of to, to point out to you that it's annoying them. And also when people are eventually referred to you, they already have symptoms for months or even years, and they have numbness in the anterolateral part of the thigh. What's also interesting about neuralgia is that sometimes people will have symptoms when they're standing or walking, but it's also possible they, they have more symptoms in a sitting position or when they're lying down. And this is also quite distinctive from, for example, spinal stenosis. So when a patient is referred to you with spinal stenosis and the patient has symptoms when sitting or lying down, it's important to realize that neuralgia is in the differential diagnosis. Then a little bit about history. Uh, the first uh, descriptions of neuralgia were made at the end of the 19th century by Bernard and also by Roth independently. And that's why sometimes it's also called the bernard roth syndrome. The two persons on the left, probably most of you know, the first one, of course, is Freud. And Freud was also dealing with neuralgia parasthetica. And it was said that because Freud was kind of a dandy, that he was wearing tight clothes, that he had these symptoms of neuralgia. Then the second person, all of you know, of course, that's Harvey Cushing. And Harvey Cushing treated the person on the right, who is Simon Newcomb, who was a famous astronomer at the end of the 19th century. And in the biography by Fulton, written on Harvey Cushing, he uh, described this case. And it was kind of an embarrassing uh, experience to Cushing because he operated Simon Newcomb and he did not improve after the surgery. Then a little bit about the experience in our own center. First uh, case of neuralgia parasthetica in uh, The Hague was operated in 1937. It was in the Ursula Clinic, which was then located in Wassenaar. And it was operated by Dr. De Vett and later by my colleagues Van Duinen, Wurtzer, and eventually Klutz in, the, in 2008, performed the first neurolysis procedure. Before that time, most patients were treated with neuroexoresis. It's also important to realize that the herniated disc was only described in 1934 by Mixter and Barr. So probably in the beginning, a lot of patients were misdiagnosed having neuralgia, while instead they probably had a herniated disc. At this moment, I think it's the other way around. So I experience a lot that patients are referred with a spinal problem and eventually they turn out to have a neuralgia. There's a nice study from the Netherlands also, which is by Van Slobbe et al where they looked at a general practitioner practice and they found that the incidence for neuralgia is about 4.3 per 10,000 person years. So it's quite, it occurs quite often more than we think. And then about the pathophysiology, in the medical textbooks, it's often been associated with overweight and aware of tight clothes. And I think it has been copied, pasted from one medical textbook to the other. And of course, it can be one of the causes for neuralgia parasthetica, but other causes, for example, are repetitive uh, motion in the hip. And um, in these images here, you can see what can be the mechanism for uh, the symptoms in case of obesity. On the right side, you can see that the fascia of scarpa can attach to the inguinal ligament. And when there's traction on the inguinal ligament, it can compress the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve. What is also visible in this image is that there's often a hard rim under the nerve, which can also compress it. And you can imagine when the patient is sitting or lying down, that there can be extra compression. These are some examples of, um, of positioning for spinal surgery, which can also cause symptoms of neuralgia parasthetica. On the left, you can see the procedure that was used in the old days when there were blocks positioned under the patient. And you can see that this block can compress the side where the nerve runs through the inguinal ligament. On the right side, you can see an image of a spine table that we frequently use for spondylolisthesis. And sometimes also people experience symptoms of neuralgia parasthetica after this procedure. Other causes iatrogenically for neuralgia parasthetica, the most famous one is of course, hip surgery through the interior approach. An incision is made just below the anterior superior iliac spine, and then the nerve is damaged. And you can see in picture A that there's an aroma of the LFCN. And in picture C, you can see that I've really dissected out the LFCN. And what you then do is that you 
follow it proximally at the side where it goes through the inguinal ligament. And then you again cut the nerve as far proximally as possible. Rates through this approach for the anterior hip surgery have been reported of 15 to 81%. Other mechanisms for iatrogenic injury are, for example, seat belt injury or a sharp injury, like in this case, where a carpenter was cutting and with his own knife, he cut into his upper leg. And there you can see, it's, it's very difficult to see, but I sutured the nerve with small 10-0 etylon sutures. Other causes for neurology parasthetica, which is important to realize is that it sometimes can be caused by a mass lesion. For example, a mass lesion in the pelvis, which is compressing the nerve. There can also be, for example, a metastasis to, to the acetabulum, or there can be a tumor in the nerve in the upper leg, like in this case, where you can see that there is a swanoma inside the LFCN, which I resected through an intercapsular resection. Of course, the last case is a pretty rare one. And you might say, well, do you have to investigate in all patients if there's another cause for myralgia parasthetica? But I think it's important to realize that when the patient is referred to you by the neurologist, that it often is the clinical diagnosis which has been made. But for me, it's important that there's at least one other exam which is pointing at myralgia, because otherwise, if there's no abnormalities in the exam, you have to be careful that there's not another cause which is causing the symptoms. Of course, there's nerve conduction, which you can do, but this has been debated somewhat because it's difficult to, to perform this analysis. So matory evoked potentials are possible. And what I personally like most is the ultrasound where you can see thickening of the nerve. I will show you later. And what you can also perform is a nerve block. It's where you put some lidocaine under the skin and you do one thumb with under the isis and one thumb with under the isis in the normal anatomy type B, as you can see here. This is an example of what you see with the ultrasound. So uh, in our center, we use the cutoff, which was determined by Sue et al. So that's five square millimeters. On the left side, you can see a normal LFCN, which is just medial to the anterior superior iliac spine. And on the right side, you can see a case where there's clear thickening of the nerve with an abnormal uh, surface area. The additional value of ultrasound is that you can also look for anatomic variation, which I just showed the most common variation is the type B, where the nerve just runs medial to the isis. But you also have other possibilities like type C, where the nerve runs through a split tendon of the sartorius muscle. Or you can have a type D or E, where the nerve is much more medial than where you normally find it. Type A, I've only seen once in a patient, and it's quite uh, unusual for type A patients to present with um, or, or to have myralgia parasthetica. And um, uh, the consequence of type D and E is that you put your incision much more medially than you would do in the case of a type B of C. And that's one of the reasons why we like to perform the ultrasound before the surgery. A little bit about the anatomy of the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve. It originates from the nerve roots L2 and L3, and then it passes just behind the psoas muscle on top of the iliac muscle and runs through the inguinal ligament. After it, it goes into the upper leg and it runs on top of the sartorius muscle. And here's again the image I just showed of the anatomical variations. And in the table under it, you can see the uh, incidences of the different anatomical variations in cadavers. And below that, the incidence with, with, with which we have found it in patients. So you can see in myralgia parasthetica, the most common is the type B, with about 80% of the cases. And in 12%, you have a more medial course. And 9%, we found that it runs through a split sartorius muscle tendon. Then you also have some anatomical variations in the... <coughs> Bless you. <laughs> In the sagittal and the transverse uh, slides, on the left case, you can see the anatomical variation for the sagittal course. Uh, it, it mostly runs under the inguinal ligament on top of the iliac muscle, but sometimes it can also run through a split uh, inguinal ligament. And uh, the transverse image is the um, anatomy that was described by Hannah, 
where you can see that the nerve uh, runs through a duplication of the, of the fascia lata. And the latter one is important because sometimes during surgery, it can be difficult to find a nerve. And that's when you open the uh, fascia lata and you look under the fascia lata on top of the sartorius muscle, sometimes you cannot find the muscle and that's the nerve. And that's actually because you're moving the nerve away. So what I do is I take a gilius forceps and then I lift up the tensor fascia lata. And then with a Jameson scissors, you kind of make a small opening in the fascia. You spread it vertically to see if the nerve is under there. And if you don't find it there, you make another small opening, just medial or lateral to it, to end up in this canal, because otherwise the risk is that you do not find the nerve. Well, about the treatment, I'm not gonna talk much about conservative treatment because I think you know that's not part of the, uh, the neurosurgical practice. But it's important to ask the patient when they're coming to you what kind of conservative treatments they have had. And uh, also with the patient who is already there in your practice, you cannot change anything anymore about what happened before that time because often patients are referred only after years of treatment. So it's important to discuss with your neurologists in the surrounding hospitals and also with the pain doctors, what kind of surgical treatment you can offer the patients. Of course, most patients are relieved by uh, conservative treatments, but as the study by Williams and all showed, about 10% of the patients have persistent symptoms and these patients can be referred for surgery. Okay, then most interesting of course are just different surgical uh, options. Uh, the two main surgical options are neurolysis and uh, neurectomy. And uh, I will discuss these more in detail further. But if you want to read a little bit more about it, I think this is a nice meta-analysis, which was conducted by Lou et al. For both procedures, you make an incision just medial to the anterior superior iliac spine, parallel to the inguinal ligaments. And then, like I discussed before, you open the fascia of the uh, fascia lata, and then you look for the nerve. Advantage obviously is when you have preoperative ultrasound is that you know whether you are dealing with the type B, like in this case, or if there's a more medial variance. Then for the neurolysis procedure, you follow the nerve proximally up to the inguinal ligament. And then you cut the inguinal ligament as far proximally as possible. At the same uh, time, you lift up the nerve and you cut the iliac fascia below the nerve. And there has been some, some debate between Dr. Hanna and me whether in this picture it's actually, if I'm cutting the iliac fascia or if it's the bottom of the, uh, the canal which he described. But I think basically what's most important is that you are aware that there might not be only compression from the ligament above, but there can also be compression from the underlying fascia, which sometimes is a hard rim. And then, like I said, you follow the nerve as far proximally as possible, but be aware that when you go more proximately is that you have the deep circumflex iliac artery and vein. And sometimes these can bleed uh, terribly. And especially because it's far away from you, it can be very dangerously. So be aware that when you go more proximately that you have artery and veins there. And especially with patients with atherosclerosis, it sometimes might not be enough to coagulate these vessels. So be careful for that. Then in the meta-analysis by Lou et al, 19 studies were included and uh, they uh, investigated the mean results and that was about 60% complete pain relief which is similar to the results we have found in our retrospective study where we found 60% pain relief. We also looked for how many revision surgeries were performed and for the neurolysis, this was 12%. Then the neurectomy procedure, basically you do the same thing as you do for the neurolysis. So you follow the nerve as far proximally as possible. Then you transect the nerve a little bit distal and you try to pull it out several centimeters out of the pelvis. And then you transect the nerve again as far proximally as possible. And here in these images, you can see that I have marked the site of compression with a blue ink marker. And you can see when I pull on the nerve that there is a proximal thickening of the nerve and you have to cut the nerve proximal to this thickening. On the right side, you can see 
the segment of nerve which was resected. And you can see with the P proximal to the side of compression and also D distal to the side of compression, there's a clear thickening of the nerve. And at the side where the nerve was compressed, you can see this hourglass phenomenon. You might ask, what is the reason why you want to follow the nerve as proximally as possible? So one of the reasons is, like I show here, that there might be a clear thickening of the nerve proximal to the side of compression. And the other one is that um, there's a possibility that if you don't cut it as far proximally as possible, that later on the proximal end is still attached to the inguinal ligament, which I think is more likely to cause neuroma pain than when you cut it as proximally as possible and the nerve falls back into the pelvis. That's probably also one of the reasons why my colleagues in the past performed the norexoviresis procedure in which they pull out the nerve out of the pelvis and uh, the nerve breaks at multiple points more proximally. I stopped doing this procedure because as a nerve surgeon, it looks terrible to pull on this nerve, but it's important to realize that you have to transect it as far proximally as possible. Then also in the study by um, Lou et al, they had included eight studies and they found a mean pain relief of 85% and there were no revision procedures reported. So what could be one of the reasons why neurolysis sometimes does not help? Uh, personally, I think it's possible that because there has been too much damage to the nerve resulting in intraneural uh, changes. Here you can see three intraneural changes which are sometimes observed uh, during the pathologic analysis. In the left side a transverse image, you can see that there is thickening of the perineurium. In the middle picture, you can see that there are mucoid depositions also a transverse image. And on the right image, which is a longitudinal image, you can see that there are scarring inside the nerve. So the, the arrows point at the scar tissue and in between you can see the longitudinal accents, which are passing in between these fibrin balls. And especially thinking that there's thickening also of the outside layer around the nerve, you can imagine that this might cause compression still after the nerve has been decompressed. So which, what did we do in this study? We uh, collected 39 specimens from patients in which we had performed a neurectomy procedure. There were 29 cases in which we performed a primary procedure and then 10 patients in which we collected a nerve after filled neurolysis. So they went for the second procedure, neurectomy, and we quantified these changes inside the nerve. Interestingly, we found no difference between the two groups which would suggest that even after neurolysis, that uh, a lot of these changes are irreversible. But it's difficult to say that because of course, there was only a mean interval between the two procedures of half a year up to a year or something. Uh, so it's possible that it needs more time to resolve. But personally, I think, especially when you have fibrin rolls inside the nerve, I find it hard to believe that these will disappear completely. Another interesting finding was that there was a weak correlation between the interneural changes and the duration of symptoms. So personally, I have the feeling that when people have had symptoms for more than two, three years, that probably or the neurolysis procedure is less likely to have a positive effect. Of course, the neurectomy procedure also has several downsides. Obviously, patients after the procedure have numbness in the anterolateral part of the thigh. Sometimes this numbness, especially in the first few weeks, can be painful. But on the other hand, we also investigated this in patients. And to be honest, most patients don't bother that they have numbness in the anterolateral part of the thigh, also because they already have had this for years. And uh, sometimes there is recurrence of symptoms, which might be caused by an aroma. And sometimes patients also have persistence of symptoms. Uh, we reported one case in 2015 where we found that there was a recurrence of symptoms a year after, uh, uh, years after a procedure, a neurectomy procedure, and we performed a um, re-resection of the proximal nerve end, which uh, relieved the patient of his sim pain symptoms, and uh, this um, supported us to further investigate this technique. So we have now performed this technique in 20 cases. We published this in World Neurosurgery. 10 cases were persistent cases and seven were recurrent cases of myralgia after previous neurectomy. What you do during this procedure is that you make an incision 
again, parallel to the inguinal ligaments, but now above the anterior superior iliac spine, you open the external upper neurosis of the abdominal wall, and then you retract the different abdominal muscles to expose the nerve end, which is lying on top of the iliac muscle. So we performed the reoperation at a mean of 11 and 24 months after a previous neurectomy for persistent and recurrent cases. And we followed these patients for several years. The uh, proximal stump could be identified in 18 out of 20 cases, and there was successful pain relief and a mean of 65%. It was more often observed after recurring cases than after persistent cases. And the presence of neuroma obviously was in all cases of recurrence and about half of the cases in which the pain symptoms persisted after the previous neurectomy. And uh, we had one complication of femoral nerve injury. And this is very important to realize when you're thinking about starting this procedure is that the anatomy proximal to the inguinal ligament can also be different, uh, like I've shown for the, uh, for the infra-inguinal anatomical differences. And sometimes the LFCN can connect with the femoral nerve. So it's very, you have to be very careful with cutting the nerve. You have to stimulate it before you cut it. Because of these uh, potential downsides of the neurectomy and also because of the disappointing results of neurolysis, others have looked at different options um, to, uh, to release the nerve. One option by Hanna et al. was uh, about trans transpositioning the nerve. So after you have released the nerve, uh, Hanna et al., they moved the nerve medially. We um, discussed this with him that I would be a little bit afraid. It's like the transposition in the ulnar nerve that you might, ki might get kinking proximal and distal to the, um, uh, to the transposition site. Uh, which could be caused by kinking at the site where you have the circumflex iliac artery and vein. And distally, you get, get kinking at the site where you have released the uh, fascia lata. Um, yeah, his uh, comments were that you have to, of course, release it as far proximally and distally as possible. But I'm still, um, yeah, I'm still looking forward to more results on this technique. Same goes for the dynamic decompression by my results, by my colleagues from Leiden. Uh, what they do is that after the decompression, they move the leg upwards and downward to see if there's residual compression. And then they either cut the underlying muscle or cut more the inguinal ligaments above. And um, it's an interesting technique and I'm also looking forward to more, more results on this. My personal opinion, more uh, class one evidence is needed. And that's why at the moment we are conducting the STOM trial in which we are investigating the two procedures of neurolysis and uh, neurectomy. Up to now, we've included 60 patients and we need a total of 90. So I think it's probably going to take a, a couple of more years to, fi to finally um, have the results for this trial. We're also doing a subgroup analysis for the duration of symptoms and also body mass index. So we hope to, uh, in the future, might be able to give patients better advice if they have had a longer duration of symptoms, might be better to do a neurectomy. If they have a high BMI, possibly also a neurectomy is better. We don't know yet at this moment. Uh, but I think for now, it's important to discuss the different pros and cons with your patients uh, about the different options of neurolysis and neurectomy and then um, uh, together make an informed uh, decision about what treatment to perform. Okay, I want to thank you all, of course, for your attention. Especially, I would like to thank also my colleagues here in the hospital, and especially my senior colleague, colleague Fred Klutz, who has uh, helped me with these procedures. And also, we have done a lot of research together. Also, I want to thank uh, my excellent um, uh, personal assistant who is doing the sonography in these patients, Michel Westein, and our neurologist, uh, Monique Vlak, Walter Osterhaus, who is the surgeon I'm doing together, the superinguinal re-resection. Uh, Marci Kuno, who has made all the anatomical drawings. And last but not least, my mentor, Rob Spinner, who has helped me uh, continuously during my career. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, now, can you please uh, stop your screen sharing? So, okay, thank you so much. Okay.
I per with your permission, I want to continue. Uh, sure. Okay. Before reading the questions in the chat part, I want to ask a question myself. Uh, first of all, does cutting the inguinal ligament increase the risk of uh, inguinal hernia later in the patient? Is yeah. there a risk? Thank hernia. you, Osman, for this question. I've never observed it, uh, to be honest. I think um, what's important is that you uh, just cut the inguinal ligaments above and you don't go medially or laterally. So you have to really keep the opening small. I think that's that's important. Okay, thank you. Now I want to go on with the chat part. And Ahmed Najjar, he didn't write his country and he asked, what do you do when neurectomy does not work? And the second question of him, also how you define neuroma, is it histology or just grossly during surgery? Yeah, thank you for these questions also, good questions. So if neurectomy doesn't work, it's important, uh, you have the option of supra re-resection, but you have to wait at least for several months before offering this procedure to the patients. Because first thing is that sometimes you see after neurectomy that patients have increased symptoms for several weeks. I do not really understand why, but it's something of a differentiation mechanism. So it's important during these first few weeks to give them enough pain medication if they're using neuropathic pain medication, continue the medication, maybe even increase the dose, but wait at least for several weeks. Then I see them back in the outpatient clinic after six weeks. If they still have a lot of pain symptoms, I try to convince them to wait for another six weeks. And then after three months, when they're still in a lot of pain, you can offer them the uh, super inguinal uh, re-resection. Uh, but be careful not to do it too fast because meanwhile, some patients might still improve. Then the question about the neuroma. So we have done some MRIs where we've looked if there is a clear thickening of the nerve to see if there's a neuroma, but um, it's very difficult to see because it's of course a very small nerve. And uh, what we do now is that we do the uh, procedure where we look for the proximal stump then again, you transect the LFCN as proximally as possible, and we send the distal end, including the neuroma, for histopathological analysis. That's right. Okay, thank you, Roger. And another question from the chat part, Professor Yunus Aydın from Turkey, uh, ask, congratulations for very didactic presentation. Is there an advantage for awake surgery to avoid complications such as femoral nerve damage? Image. Yeah, very good question also. Thank you. Um, well, there, there is a, one study, I think it's from uh, Japan, where they've done a, uh, uh, like with local anesthetics, a neurolysis, and they can also stimulate the nerve. If the patient is feeling the same pain symptoms in the interlateral part of the thigh, you know it's the right nerve. Um, but what I prefer, because I think it's rather painful for people to especially when you're doing the incision of the iliac fascia, that can be really painful. So when I have a more medial variant where I'm doing a neurectomy and you're afraid of, uh, of, of damaging the femoral nerve, I always use intraoperative monitoring. And then you can, uh, can stimulate the nerve. And of course, when there's contraction in the upper leg, you know that it's the femoral nerve. Thank you, Dr. Alper, would you like to continue? Thank you for wonderful and very informative lecture. Uh, I want to continue with the question with chat, uh, in the chat of part of the Zoom program. Uh, we please question, continue to uh, I, I I want to ask a question myself. Does cutting the inguinal ligaments increase the risk of inguinal hernia later in, uh, in the patients? Yeah, I think we already discussed that. So. Yeah. I haven't seen any case any cases of uh, of herniation through the inguinal. Yeah, uh, I ask it, this question. Alper, continue with the Ahmed Najjar's comment and ask. Uh, I will continue. Okay, Ahmed Najjar ask another question. Sorry, do you think that neurostimulation for manager paresthetica? 
Yeah, so like I just said, I think it's a good option, especially in the more medial variants where you're afraid that you might damage the femoral nerve. Uh, neurostimulation is indeed helpful. Okay. And Mahmoud Camlar from Turkey, also associated professor. Thank you for the excellent presentation. Maybe I missed. Is there any indication for radiofrequence in the treatment? Yeah, also a very good question, and also thank you for your uh, for your kind comment. Um, yeah, so in, in our hospital, sometimes they do the ra radio frequency, uh, but I hear back from our pain doctors that they find it very difficult also to locate the nerve uh, because they are not using sonography for the... Um, um, so they just do a, a blind blockage of the nerve. And then I think when you're doing it blind and you're also doing the radio frequency, that's not very good treatment. So I have no experience with that in my hospital. And to be honest, I'm, I'm glad with it because at the moment we're conducting the STOM trial. So I think when you would have patients who had had uh, radio frequency before, it might influence your results. But I know that other centers are, are doing this and they are having uh, good results also. So I think it's, a, it's an option that you can discuss also with your patient. Okay, thank you. And can I see any other questions? And I want to, Ahmed Najjar, uh, thank you, Professor thank you. very much. He wrote. And I want to ask another question. Uh, in the technique, I want to know, do you ligate the proximal end of the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve to prevent neuroma formation when you perform neurectomy? Yeah, that's a good question. I, I think no one really knows what, what you can do best with the proximal stump when you have resected the neuroma. That's not, not only for the hemorrhagia parasthetica, but also in other types of surgery for neuroma. Uh, I know there was a colleague in the Netherlands who was doing like the central 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 anastomosis. So he would cut the nerve uh, longitudinally in two parts, and he would reconnect the uh, the two ends in in order to prevent the neuroma. Also, some people say that you have to bury it inside the muscle, and uh, for other types of neuroma, they are also of course burying it into bone, making a small hole. Uh, personally, I think that the neuroma becomes painful when it gets reattached to something. So you also see that with amputation of the digital nerve, when you have amputation of the fingers, that you have more chance for developing a painful neuroma than for example, when you're harvesting a sural nerve for, uh, for transplantation. If the nerve is deep under the fascia, it's less likely to become sym symptomatic. So that's the reason why I think you have to transect the nerve as far proximally as possible. And then obviously when you're doing that, it would be very difficult to, uh, to also put a ligation around it. So I I'm not doing it. Another interesting thing which, which we found is that um, I see more often neuroma in patients in which I've done uh, a neurectomy on the left side than in patients on the right side. And I think that has to do because I'm right-handed that with the um, anterior superior iliac spine uh, lateral to your nerve, it's more difficult with your right hand to cut it as far proximally as possible because the uh, isis is in the way. And since I know that, that we find it more often in left-sided cases, I try to uh, stand a little bit above the patient so you're not sitting, but you're standing and you really go with your Jameson scissors as far proximally into the pelvis as possible. Okay, okay. thank you thank very much. And Ahmed Ajar ask another question. I didn't understand uh, quietly, but maybe you understand what is the main DDX for hemorrhagia parasitica? What does it mean? I don't know. I don't know the abbreviation DDX also. I think the DDX. differential diagnosis maybe. Okay, uh, Ahmed Najjar, if you there. Yeah, yeah, differential yeah. So the also interesting question: the main differential diagnosis. For, for me, but it's also because I'm a spine surgeon, is if a patient has spinal stenosis or, of course, like a foraminal compression of L2 or L3. But sometimes you also see patients with uh, bursitis trochanterica. So what's important is first the anamnesis. So when the patient tells you that uh, the pain symptoms start in the back, obviously, and they radiate to the leg, you have to be uh, careful that it could also be a spinal problem. 
And with the bursitis, of course, you have to touch also at the uh, uh, trochanterica major to see if there's uh, pain over there. And um, uh, for the stump trial, we uh, perform a MRI in all patients to exclude a spinal problem. But I think those are the two uh, most important differential diagnoses. Okay. I think we finished. Okay. I'm an Ajat, thank you. And I think we finished all the questions and comments. And I want to thank you one more time for your wonderful lecture. I hope we can see each other in the near future. Okay. Thank you for everyone who joined us tonight, today, this evening. Okay. Thank you to you all. I really enjoyed it. Thank you again. Thank you. Bye-bye.